Well, it's great to be here tonight, and it's exciting to be at the beginning of something new. These are going to be great memories someday of having been here at the beginning of a great church. I like the fact that it's a little hot in here because I, I feel really comfortable. It's, it's just like back home. And, you know, I was thinking about one of my fondest memories from uh, when I was a teenager and I first got into a good soul-winning independent fundamental Baptist church, July 1998 going to my first Sunday night service at Regency Baptist Church. And uh, the pastor was sick, so somebody else was filling in. But I remember it was like 110 degrees or something, because Sacramento has some really hot days like that. And this church building had no air conditioning, but they just had all the doors open and they had fans on. It's like 110 degrees outside, you know, six in the evening. And we were just in metal folding chairs that had stenciled on the back of every metal folding chair, Nuestra Casa. They just got it from like a Mexican restaurant or somewhere. And it was just the hardest preaching I'd ever heard because I'd, I'd been five years in the liberal church with the air conditioning and the soft pews and it was like 20 minutes of a sermon. I just remember sitting in there just sweating hard preaching it was hot just ripping face on soul winning and everything else and i was just like i love this like where has this been all my life so it just brings back great memories and uh, the this is a day that we're going to look back on many years from now thinking about the beginnings of pure words baptist church and it's it's going to be great to be here on sunday morning you know for the first service as well so it's exciting now what i want to preach about tonight is the deceitfulness of riches. If you look down at Mark 4, look at verse 18. The Bible reads, And these are they which are sown among thorns, such as hear the word, and the cares of this world, and the deceitfulness of riches, and the lusts of other things entering in, choke the word, and it becometh unfruitful. So the, I want to focus on that phrase, the deceitfulness of riches. Riches. There's something similar over in Matthew 13, if you want to flip over there, Matthew 13. You see, deception is when you're being tricked or you're being fooled or you're beguiled, right? That's what it means to be deceived. And the Bible says that riches are deceitful. That means that they offer something that they don't really deliver on, right? That, you know, you have a, a certain idea, but it turns out not to be right. Look at Matthew chapter 13, verse 22. He also that received seed among the thorns is he that heareth the word and the care of this world and the deceitfulness of riches choke the word and he becometh unfruitful. Now, according to the Bible, the deceitfulness of riches can cause us to become unfruitful. Why is that? Well, flip back to chapter six of Matthew. The reason why the deceitfulness of riches can make us unfruitful is because you cannot serve God and mammon. You can't serve God and money. So if riches deceive you, they can actually take you out of the fight and cause you to become unfruitful. You're no longer evangelizing like we heard about in the last sermon. Look at Matthew 6, 19. Lay not up for yourselves treasures upon earth where moth and rust doth corrupt and where thieves break through and steal, but lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven where neither moth nor rust doth corrupt, and where thieves do not break through nor steal. For where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. The light of the body is the eye. If therefore thine eye be single, thy whole body shall be full of light. But if thine eye be evil, thy whole body shall be full of darkness. If therefore the light that is in thee be darkness, how great is that darkness? No man can serve two masters, for either he will hate the one and love the other, or else he will hold to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and mammon. So you have to choose today, is your life going to be about laying up treasures on earth, or is it about laying up treasures in heaven? Are you seeking money with your life, or are you seeking first the kingdom of God and his righteousness? Now flip back to Ecclesiastes chapter 2, and I'm going to give you three deceptions of riches, the threefold deceitfulness of riches, because deception means a lie. So what are the lies that are out there that the devil would get us to believe about riches or that riches could entice us with? Number one, the deceitfulness is that riches will make you happy. Now, this is what a lot of people think today, that riches will make you happy. And look, in your life, you're going to seek after something in your life. 
unless you're just a complete loser, just you're lazy, you do nothing, you're going to do something with your life. And the two big things that it usually boils down to are seeking after mammon or seeking after God. Because, you know, most people in their life are going to be seeking after something, whether it's to serve God, please God, get closer to God, and that's their big thing. Or their big thing is about getting rich, making money, having a fancy car, fancy house, whatever the, the things that they crave in their life. But the deceitfulness is that the world today thinks that riches will make you happy, don't they? That's the lie that's out there. And most people believe that lie. But look what the Bible says in Ecclesiastes chapter 2, verse 4. I made me great works. I builded me houses. I planted me vineyards. I made me gardens and orchards. And I planted trees in them of all kind of fruits. I made me pools of water. It's pretty obvious that this guy's got money, right? I mean, he's got houses, gardens, orchards, swimming pools. He said he watered therewith the wood that bringeth forth trees. Verse 7, I got me servants and maidens and had servants born in my house. Also, I had great possessions of great and small cattle above all that were in Jerusalem before me. I gathered me also silver and gold and the peculiar treasure of kings and of the provinces. I got me men singers and women singers and the delights of the sons of men as musical instruments and that of all sorts. So I was great and increased more than all that were before me in Jerusalem. Also my wisdom remained with me and whatsoever mine eye desired, I kept not from them. So, I mean, this guy saw something, he bought it. He didn't even think about it. He did, money was no object. Whatever he saw, he just gave it to himself. And it says, I withheld not my heart from any joy. For my heart rejoiced in all my labor, and this was the portion of all my labor. Then I looked on all the works that my hands had wrought, and on the labor that I had labored to do. And I said, boy, this is living. This is the life. Is that what he said? No, he said it's all vanity, but not only was it vanity, because vanity just means it's empty, it's worthless, it's meaningless, but he said it was vexation of spirit. Vexation. Think about that word vexation. You know, the Bible verse that comes to mind is when Lot beheld the wicked deeds of Sodom and Gomorrah and all the perverts and homos, and it said he vexed his righteous soul daily in seeing and hearing their evil deeds. You know what that means? It really just bothered him. It bugged him. It was an irritation to him, right? Yeah. Well, look, the Bible said here that all the wonderful things that Solomon had purchased and built and acquired and done, he actually looked at them and they bugged him. They were a vex. It was all just a vexation of spirit to him. Not only did he feel neutral toward it, he actually felt negative toward his wealth at this point because he looks at it and it did not give him the happiness that he thought it was going to give him. And he said there was no profit under the sun. It was unprofitable. It was vain. And not only that, it vexed his spirit. Jump down to verse 17. You say, oh man, if I could just get ahead financially, if I could just turn the corner financially, if I could just pay off the house, or if I could just get the boat or the RV. No, this is where you'll be when you get all your financial goals. It says in verse 17, therefore I hated life. I mean, is that where you want to be? Do you want to get to the point where you say, I hate life. My spirit is vexed with the boat. It's vexed with the RV. It's vexed with the Cadillac and the Mercedes. It's vexed with the summer home and the winter. I hate my life! But people think it's going to bring happiness. Why? Because it's the deceitfulness of riches. Are you deceived tonight? Have you been deceived where you think, oh man, if I could just get these possessions, I'm going to be so happy. That stuff doesn't bring happiness. Amen. It's a lie. He said, I hated life. Because the work that is wrought under the sun is grievous unto me, for all is vanity and vexation of spirit. Yea, I hated all my labor which I had taken under the sun, because I should leave it unto the man that should be after me. Look at chapter 5 in Ecclesiastes, chapter 5, verse 10. You say, oh man, if I could just get the, the finances that I need, I'd be so happy. Look at verse 10 of Ecclesiastes 5. He that loveth silver shall not be satisfied with silver. Money doesn't satisfy. I mean, that's what the Bible is saying here. And then he said, nor he that loveth abundance 
You know, the guy who loves that fat bank account, the fat billfold, the abundance of goods, it says, you know what? He's not going to be satisfied with that increase. It's vanity. Look at verse 11. When goods increased, they are increased that eat them. Now, I can give a testimony about that because I've got 12 eaters in my house. And it says, and what good is there to the owners thereof, saving the beholding of them with their eyes? You know, the sports cars, the fancy outfits, the wardrobes, the decorations, the paintings on the wall, the original, you know, first printing, first edition of this book and that artwork and that artifact and that treasure. What, what good is it? You just can look at it? The beholding of them with your eyes? The sleep of a laboring man, verse 12, is sweet, whether he eat little or much, but the abundance of the rich will not suffer him to sleep. There's a sore evil which I've seen under the sun, namely, riches kept for the owners thereof to their hurt. So riches can be a curse, the Bible says. But those riches perish by evil travail. And he begat at the sun, and there's nothing in his hand. As he came forth of his mother's womb, naked shall he return to go as he came, and shall take nothing of his labor, which he may carry away in his hand. And this is also a sore evil, that in all points as he came, so shall he go. And what profit hath he that hath labored for the wind? Wasting your life, laboring for the wind. You came into this world naked. You're going to go out of this world naked, the Bible says. In all points, the way that you came in is the way that you're going to go out. And it's vanity to spend your life seeking money. The deceitfulness of riches is, number one, that riches will make you happy. But number two, it's that riches will last forever. See, the deceitfulness of riches is that people think that once they get riches, they're going to stay rich. They're going to keep those riches. But how many times have people been rich and lost everything? Happens all the time. And we know, of course, that upon physical death, you're certainly going to lose everything. We remember the story about the man who said, oh, I'm going to build a bigger barn and I'm going to lay up all my goods. And just the day that he retired, literally the day that he said, all right, I can retire. I can relax. God said, thou fool, this night shall thy soul be required of thee. Amen. What shall become of all this that thou hast laid up? You know, just the very night of his retirement, he's so happy. He got his gold watch or whatever, you know, retirement. He's just about to just enjoy. Now I can just enjoy. You die tonight. That's what God did. And you know, God did that on purpose. Just to show that guy and just to teach a lesson to all of us. Now, look, you say, well, what, you know, what's wrong with waiting for retirement and looking forward to that? Well, I'm looking forward to my retirement when I die. Amen. I mean, think about it, and that's a great retirement. It lasts forever. You're never going to lose it. It's never going to go bankrupt or anything. You know, you say, well, I want to retire at 65. Just retire at 70 when you die. You know, no, I'm just kidding. We don't, uh, hopefully you'll live longer than that. But, you know, whenever it is, what's a few more years? You waited your whole life to retire. You know, you might as well just wait all the way until the bitter end. And quit laying up your treasures on this earth so you can just enjoy them for a couple years. If you lay them up in heaven, you can enjoy them forever. The deceitfulness of riches is that they will last forever. People who have riches, they're very confident that they will continue to be rich, that they will remain rich. They can lose those things even on this earth. Go to James chapter 1. The Bible says, Lay not up for yourselves treasures upon earth, where moth and rust doth corrupt, and where thieves break through and steal. The Bible says in Proverbs 23, 4, Labor not to be rich, Cease from thine own wisdom. Wilt thou set thine eyes upon that which is not? Listen to this. For riches certainly make themselves wings. They fly away as an eagle toward heaven. You know, so picture all these money bags. Picture like a bag with a big dollar sign on it, like on a cartoon. You know, you have like these money bags. And just picture these little wings on it and it's just kind of flying away, right? The Bible says that riches make themselves wings and fly away. Meaning that you don't understand how they left. You don't understand where the money went, but the money's just gone. So don't be deceived into thinking that riches are permanent. They're never permanent. At best, they can last you a lifetime, but even then, they get stolen. They make wings. They fly away. You lose the wealth. Look at James 1, verse 8. A double-minded man is unstable in all his ways. Remember, 
You can't serve God and mammon. You got to pick. You can't be double minded and say, well, I really want to make it financially and I want to serve the Lord to the best of my ability. Those two things are not compatible. Now, obviously, we need to go work six days a week and, and make money and pay the bills, but we got to seek first the kingdom of God. Our main focus in life should be on pleasing the Lord, not on becoming wealthy. And when we go to work, we work as unto the Lord. And on Monday when we go to work and on Tuesday when we go to work, we're working because God told us to work. We're working to put food on the table. We're working to pay the bills, but we're not working so we can get rich someday. Our attitude should be, I'm serving the Lord today. It's about serving God. It's about winning people to Christ. It's about reading the Bible, getting closer to God, going to church, being a blessing to the church. Hey, that's what my life is about. Amen. Work is something that I do that's a means to an end. Money is a tool that I use to serve God and to live my life in a way that pleases God. But we got to make sure that it doesn't become about the money and about the career and about the job. Now, those things are important. I don't want to downplay them too much, but we need to keep them in their proper place. Right. At the end of the day, who are we serving? Amen. The Lord. Right. And whatever we do should be as unto the Lord. Even just whether we eat or drink, we are the Lord's. We're bought with a price. Amen. He says in verse nine, let the brother of low degree rejoice in that he's exalted. You know what that means? That means if you're here tonight, and you are one that would be considered low income. You're considered working class or lower class. You're the brother of low degree. That's just the Bible's way of saying lower economic class. You know what he's saying? You ought to rejoice if that's you. Like, oh man, you don't understand what it's like being poor, being low income. Hey, rejoice. Let the brother of low degree, let that low income brother rejoice. In that he is exalted. By whom? By God. Blessed are ye poor, he said in Luke chapter 6. But the rich, in that he is made low, because as the flower of the grass, he shall pass away. So the deceitfulness of riches is number one, that it's going to make you happy, but number two, that it's going to last forever. He says, nope, rich man, it's going to pass away like the flower of the grass. It's not going to last forever. Look if you would at James 5. You're already in James. Just go a couple pages to the right. Chapter 5, verse 1. Go to now, ye rich men. Weep and howl for your miseries that shall come upon you. Your riches are corrupted and your garments are moth-eaten. You know that fancy suit, the Italian suit, the $1,000 suit, the $2,000 suit. You know what? The moths will come and eat that when you're not paying attention. Who's ever had their clothing eaten by moths before? What in the world? There's like five people with their hands up. Is, is this like a regional thing or something? Man, I, we have, I've had mods eat my clothing. You know, you, you, you pull out a suit that you haven't worn in a while. It has all these little holes in it. Maybe you just didn't know what that was. Those are mods. Okay. I mean, mods. I know in Sacramento, California, our clothes would get eaten by mods. In Phoenix, Arizona, I've seen the clothing eaten by mods. I, it's a thing, people. Five of you, believe me. But you know what? What if that's your fanciest suit? You can't fix that. Those little holes, what do you do? How do you fix it? Put a big patch over it or something? Your Italian suit? It's not going to work, right? And the moths will come in and eat your clothing. He says, your riches are corrupted. Your garments are moth-eaten. Your gold and silver is cankered. And the rust of them shall be a witness against you and shall eat your flesh as it were fire. Ye have heaped treasure together for the last days. This is pretty negative. This is some pretty hard preaching here. I mean, this is a strong rebuke to people who are putting money first and they're putting righteousness on the back burner. These are people, the Bible says in verse four, you know, they're, they're, they're keeping back the wages of their workers by fraud. You know, they're, they're kind of a penny pinching, nickel nipping, kind of a, a tightwad employer that's, that's uh, ripping off their employees. Behold, the hire of the laborers who've reaped down your fields, which is of you kept back by fraud, crieth. And the cries of them which have reaped are entered into the ears of the Lord of Sabaoth. Sabaoth means hosts. The Lord of hosts has heard the cries. You've lived in pleasure on the earth and been wanton. You've nourished your hearts as in a day of slaughter. What does that mean? You know, on a day of slaughter, when you slaughter an animal, it's a big party. 
and you know it's a big feast right when you when you slaughter an animal he's saying you know you're living like that every day like every day is slaughter day while your workers are starving and you're ripping them off and everything and the bottom line is that these people here these rich people in james 5 they're not putting the Lord first. They're not putting his righteousness first. They don't care first and foremost about the Lord Jesus Christ. They care about themselves and their bottom line. And he's rebuking them hard. And he's saying, you know what? I can take that away from you. I can send the moths to eat your clothing. I can send the rust to, to destroy your precious metals. I can send the thieves to break through and steal your money. So the deceitfulness of riches, number one, is that it's going to make you happy. It's not. Number two is that it's going to last forever. It's not going to last forever. And number three, go to 1 Timothy chapter 6, is the lie that says that riches won't corrupt you. What are the lies that people believe about being rich? They think, oh, well, number one, they think, man, if I could just be rich, I'll be happy. It's a lie. Then number two, they think, oh, man, you know, if I can just get to a certain point financially, I'll be set for life. How many times have you heard those words? Set for life. They think it's permanent. I'll be set for life. That's a lie. You won't be set for life. And number three, they say, oh, you know what? No matter how rich I am, I'm still going to be the same person. Isn't that what people say? Oh, I'm still just that same person that you grew up with. I'm still the same guy. You won't be the same person. You will become a rotten person. Riches will corrupt you. Look what the Bible says in 1 Timothy 6, 9. But they that will be rich fall. They that will be rich fall. Just, just think about those words. What does it mean, they that will be rich? They that want to be rich. People who want to be rich. People who have this thought, and you don't, they don't even have to be rich people. Just people who want to be rich. They that will be rich fall. He says, but they that will be rich fall into temptation and a snare. You know what they're falling into? A trap. A snare is a trap. He said, look, people who want to be rich fall into a trap. They fall in a trap. It's the deceitfulness of riches, right? What's a trap? It's a deception, right? The little piece of cheese and then the mouse goes in. It's a trap. The mouse is deceived. That's how all traps work through deception. Money and the love of money and riches deceive people. They that will be rich fall into temptation and a snare and into many foolish and hurtful lusts which drown men in destruction and perdition. For the love of money is the root of all evil. Of all evil. Now, if you think about a root, the root is what produces the plant. So if you're out pulling weeds, mom will tell you, make sure that you pull up the root as well. Because if you just pull up the plant and you leave the root, what's going to happen? The plant's going to come right back. So the root is that which produces the plant, right? So when the Bible says the love of money is the root of all evil, think about a root. If I had a root in my hand, right? and I took that root and I planted it in the earth, something's gonna grow, right? If I have a living root and I plant it in the earth, some kind of plant's gonna grow. Now, depending on what kind of root I have, right? That's gonna determine what kind of plant grows from that root, right? But see, the love of money is like this universal root. All evil grows out of this root. You understand what I'm saying? Because like a physical root, if I plant it in the earth, it's going to grow a certain plant, one specific thing. You know, whatever the, the weed that that is or whatever the, the plant that that is, that's what this root is going to produce if I plant this root in the earth. But the love of money is the root of all evil. Meaning, I mean, you, this root, fornication grows out of this root, rape, murder, just lust, robbery, just everything wicked, blasphemy, pride, foolishness. I mean, the love of money is the root of all evil. I mean, this is the most dangerous root to have in the soil of your heart. You know, we're talking about the parable of the sower and the deceitfulness of riches, 
choking the word, making it unfruitful. I mean, if there's one root that you want to rip out of the garden of your heart, that you want to rip out of the soil of your heart, you need to get in there and dig deep and totally eradicate the love of money from your heart. I mean, just get it all. I mean, rip it out and don't just kind of just pull up the plant and leave. No, no, no. Be, you better be sure to go really deep and pluck up every last bit of the love of money from your heart. You know, and I think it's possible to remove the love of money from your heart in general, but still have a little bit left. Get it all out. Get it all out because this is the root of all evil. This could lead to all kinds of sin and wickedness in your life. And it says, the love of money is the root of all evil, which while some coveted after, verse 10, they've erred from the faith and pierced themselves through with many sorrows. I mean, all kinds of bad things happen, sadness, sorrow, pain, suffering, hurtful lusts, every evil. He says, but thou, O man of God, verse 11, flee these things. And follow after righteousness, godliness, faith, love, patience, meekness. He's saying just run away, flee, run screaming the other direction from these love of money types and, and the, the Donald Trump seminar and the Robert Kiyosaki seminar about making money and, and worshiping money and those type of things. And, you know, I was preaching against Donald Trump long before he became president for, for the love of money. You know, for writing books, teaching people to love money and to seek after becoming wealthy and for basically becoming a role model of someone who seeks after wealth and riches and the love of money. You say, well, is it a sin to be rich? It's not a sin to be rich, but desiring to be rich will cause you to fall into a trap, to fall into temptation, to fall into a snare. Amen. And so seeking riches is going to lead you into all manner of sin. The Bible says you don't have to turn there. If you would turn to Proverbs 16, but in Proverbs chapter one, it says for the turning away of the simple shall slay them and the prosperity of fools shall destroy them. So don't buy into this lie that, oh, if I'm rich, I'll still be the same person. No, you won't be the same person. You will get worse and worse and worse and worse and more corrupt and more rotten of a person. The more you seek after money, the more you desire to be rich, and the more the love of the money uh, starts to, you know, germinate in the soil of your heart, you're just going to get worse and worse and worse. So lie number one is that riches will make you happy. Lie number two is that riches will last forever. You'll be set for life. And number three is that riches won't corrupt you. You'll still be the same person. Those are all three lies. Okay. But... Here's the good news. That's the bad news. The good news is that serving God will give you everything that riches won't give. Serving the Lord, because remember, you, you can't serve God and mammon. You got to pick, right? Well, serving God gives you everything that riches promised you but lied about. Serving God actually gives you those things. So like number one, we said, you know, riches won't make you happy. But guess what? Serving God will make you happy. Amen. Because the Bible said in uh, Psalm 6, you're in Proverbs 16, but in Psalm 16, 11, it said, Thou wilt show me the path of life. In thy presence is fullness of joy. At thy right hand, there are pleasures forevermore. Joy unspeakable and full of glory. The fruit of the Spirit is joy. You know, real happiness comes from serving the Lord. Amen. So serving the Lord brings the real happiness that money promised but couldn't deliver. Amen. But number two, riches won't last forever, but your reward in heaven will last forever. The Bible said in 1 John 2, 17, the world passeth away and the lust thereof, but he that doeth the will of God abideth forever. Amen. He that doeth the will of God abideth forever. Lay up treasures in heaven where moth and rust do not corrupt and where thieves do not break through nor steal for where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. And number three, riches will corrupt you, but serving God will make you a better person. So it does the opposite of what riches will do to you. It actually gives you everything that money promised it would give you, but it actually delivers. Amen. Amen. Look at Proverbs 16, verse 1. The preparations of the heart in man and the answer of the tongue is from the Lord. All the ways of a man are clean in his own eyes, but the Lord weigheth the spirits. Commit thy works unto the Lord 
and thy thoughts shall be established. Look at verse six. By mercy and truth, iniquity is purged, and by the fear of the Lord, men depart from evil. You know, serving God makes you a better person. When you commit your works unto the Lord, all your thoughts will be established. Mercy and truth will cause your iniquity to be purged. By the fear of the Lord, you will depart from evil. You will live a better life, a cleaner life, a more righteous life. As you bring forth fruit, God will purge you, and then you'll bring forth even more fruit. So you will become a better person. You won't be the same person you used to be. And people will say, wow, you've changed. You're different. You know, ever since you started going to Pure Words Baptist Church, it's like you're just not the same anymore. Amen. 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 We ought to be different. Right. But at least it's an improvement. Amen. Not like, man, ever since you started making the big bucks, ever since you started driving fancy cars, you're just not the same guy anymore. But that's a negative thing. But, you know, when you start getting serious about serving the Lord, when you start attending church regularly and you start growing and, and, and learning and, and, and loving the Bible and, and loving the people of God and loving the Word of God, things are going to change in your life for the better. Now, look, all of us want to be happy. Amen? Amen. I want to be happy. You know, all of us want something permanent in our life, something that's going to last. You know, we don't want to work for the wind. We don't want to work and, and, and put a bunch of effort into something. It's just all in vain. It all gets wasted. It all is just a, a waste of time. Nobody wants that, right? We all want to be happy. We all want our life to mean something for eternity, permanently, right? And we all want to be a better person. Nobody wants to become a scumbag. Nobody wants to become a rotten person. No one wants to become selfish, self-centered, Right? Just a dirt bag. Nobody wants to be like that. At least nobody in this room. I mean, nobody who's saved, you know, just wants to be scum. Amen. I mean, you know, according to the inward man, we all want to serve God. We all want to love God. We all delight in the law of God after the inward man. You know, some of you have got him buried very deeply, but he's in there somewhere. <laughs> and what I mean by the inward man is the real you, the new you, the saved you, the spiritual you. He's down there somewhere. And the thing is, we all want these things, right? It's normal. It's part of human nature to want to be happy, to want to have something permanent in our lives, and to want to improve ourselves. These are three things that are just perfectly natural. Money comes to us and says, you know what? I can give you what you want. You want to be happy? I'll make you happy. You want security and stability and permanence in your life? I'll give that to you. Hey, you want to be a better person? You want to be philanthropic? You want to help people and be a blessing to people? Oh, I'll give that to you because once you have money, then you'll be able to give to charity and everything. You know, you're going to be this great person. You're going to be a rotten scumbag. And you know, when you look at these really rich people, when they do give away money, it's always to the most rotten causes. Yeah. Right. I was just reading about some guy and he was some con artist and he was ripping people off. He's in prison now. He was a Hollywood guy and he had all kinds of money and everything like that. And it was talking about how he was really big on charity. The biggest charity he was big on was just on vaccinating. You know, he's just giving all his money to make sure everybody gets vaccinated. You know, you look at you look at the charities that the Hollywood actors give to. You know, if you look up you look up actors and actresses on Wikipedia and you look up the little section that says like personal life. Oh, man, it's ugly on almost all of them. Right? Just look up all your favorite famous actors and actresses. Look up where it says personal life. Oh, here's where they got married in a traditional Jewish wedding. And here's where they gave all their money to same-sex marriage. And here's where they gave all their money to pro-choice. And here's where they gave all their money to this left-wing Democrat campaign and everything like that. Right? So it's like, oh, they give to charity. All oh, these rich people, they're so philanthropic. They give away so much money. They give it to the devil, yeah. right? Amen. You know, sterilizing third world countries with vaccines, putting all kinds of weird experimental things in their vaccines, you know, uh, giving money towards some queer and lesbian cause, giving money to this synagogue of Satan and that Jewish thing and that, you know, it's all these rotten causes. Why? Because by the time they got all that money, they're a rotten person. 
They don't give to Jesus Christ. They don't give. I, I mean, find me the Hollywood actor that says, hey, you know, he donates a lot of money to his local independent Baptist church. <laughs> no, but I'll show you where they donate to Planned Parenthood. Oh, this Hollywood actor gave all this money to Planned Parenthood. They gave money to the United Nations. They gave money to these people, that people. It's all the worst causes because by the time they get there, they're rotten. Amen. I don't want to be a rotten person. I'd rather be a poor person and have integrity. Amen. I'd rather be a poor person that's happy than a rich person who's miserable. I'd rather be a poor person who loves the Lord than a rich person who loves himself. I'd rather be a poor person who's a blessing and refreshing like a cold drink of water to his friends and family than to be a, a rich person who's just a pain in the rear end that none of his friends and family even want to be around him because ever since he got money, he's just not the same. You know what? Everything that money lies to you and says, here, let me offer you all this, the Lord gives you all that when you serve him. The deceitfulness of riches on one side or serving God. You can't have both. You know, Brother Shelley here is, is the pastor of, of Pure Words Baptist Church. You know, he's not choosing a life that leads to riches. It's not like he chose to make his fortune. You know, what he's chosen is to serve the Lord with his life. Okay. And you can't do both. You can't say, like, well, I'm going to start an independent fundamental Baptist church and I'm going to become really wealthy at the same time. It's just not going to happen unless you lie, cheat, steal, you know, whatever. And there are preachers who do that. You know, you got the Kenneth Copeland and the Joel Osteen and T.D. Jakes and whatever. You know, defying irony, oneness Pentecostal T.D. Jakes preaching on the Trinity Broadcasting Network. You know, go figure. <laughs> but, you know, you got all these, these, uh, these wealthy preachers, but, you know, they're not serving God. They're serving only mammon because you cannot serve God and mammon. It's one or the other. You got a bunch of independent fundamental Baptist preachers serving God, right? Serving God. That's why they don't live in mansions. That's why they don't drive all these really fancy cars and just have all this extra money and wealth and everything like that and wear fancy clothes. And, you know, I don't believe that pastors should be poor. You know, I just believe we should just be in the middle state. You know, the Bible said in Proverbs 30, give me neither poverty nor riches. Feed me with food convenient for me. You know, we, we should just be at a middle station. I'm not taking a vow of poverty. I'm not asking Brother Shelley to take a vow of poverty tonight. But what I am saying is that I'm never going to be rich. He's never going to be rich. He's never going to be rich. Why? Because that's not what God has called us to do. Amen. Jesus Christ was not rich and we're not better than him. If Jesus Christ wasn't rich, we don't need to be rich. You know, if John the Baptist wasn't rich, if Peter wasn't rich, if John and James weren't rich, you know, if Elijah and Elisha weren't rich, if Isaiah, Jeremiah, Ezekiel, Daniel, they weren't rich. You know what? There are people who want to be rich, and they're wicked people. And if you've got that in your heart, you need to get rid of it tonight. You need to, you need to dig down and tear that out and say, you know what? I want to serve God. I want to serve God. I can't serve God and mammon. i got to pick one. I'm going to serve God. Yeah, sure, I'm going to go to work. Of course, i got to work hard and give 110% at my job because I'm doing it as unto Christ. Yeah. But the goal is not to live an extravagant lifestyle. The goal is to put effort into serving God. So you need to prioritize your life around the things of God. And what gets you up in the morning more than anything else should be to just wake up and say, okay, God, you know, I'm here to serve you. I love you. What have you got for me? Not to just get up and be like, all right, you know, 362 more days until I've got enough money to make that purchase or what, you know, and that's just what you're living for in Canada. It should be like, all right, you know, 362 more days and I'm done reading my Bible cover to cover, you know, for the umpteenth time, you know, or, or whatever, right? Let's bow our eyes and have a word of prayer. Father, we thank you so much for your word, Lord, and, and we thank you that your word is the truth. Yes. Money, riches, they, they deceive us, but you tell us the truth, Lord. And so help us to realize your word is truth. Kiyosaki and Donald Trump, they're not telling us the truth. They tell us that wealth will make us happy. It's a lie. Lord God, help us to seek first your kingdom and your righteousness. And it's in Jesus' name we pray, amen.